Welcome to the Zeno Podcast, where we learn about stories that shape us and how we shape them. Uh, today we're going to be talking to two of our professors, Dr. Williams and Dr. Hyde. Um, so before we get started, we're just going to ask you a question because we feel like this tells a lot about a person. What is your favorite candy bar? I don't like candy bars. I like I dark chocolate. See, dark chocolate, just like a solid brick. Like, how do you get the dark chocolate? Hazelnuts. Hazelnuts. Nice. Okay. Yes, I like Snickers. They're great. Mm. I can't eat them, but they're great to eat. <laughs> <laughs> Why can't you eat them? Do the you? doctor says no. Oh, okay. <laughs> yes, always. <laughs> so you're saying disciplined then? <laughs> not entirely disciplined. Every right. once in a while. Yeah, treat yourself. Treat yeah, myself. Absolutely. Okay. I'm a Butterfingers person myself. Yes. All kinds. Okay. Every single candy bar. <laughs> but, okay, so we're going to get started um, just to introduce you guys. So Dr. Scott Hyde is yes. the Department Chair of Mathematics at BYU-Hawaii, and his PhD is in Statistics, and he has seven kids. I do. <laughs> so many. Like, how do you, <laughs> I don't know, I mean, what's it like being a father of seven kids well they're spread out i have a an oldest is 22 and a youngest is two okay awesome. so how many are home all of them are right now except for one that's on a mission in ogden utah awesome uh, that's where i'm from <coughs> kind of my grandparents live there so awesome nice statistics and parenting seven kids just mastering chaos <laughs> that's <laughs> right <laughs> couldn't do it without my wife yeah awesome. awesome and dr williams has taught at byu since 1977 except for a couple of years in between. Um, so what were all the breaks for besides getting your PhD? Well, the first one was an exchange with um, a member of the English department at BYU Provo, where we had an annual exchange where I would teach there and a professor would come here to teach for that experience. And the others involved uh, consulting work that I did uh, for a large Swiss-based pharmaceutical called Hoffman La Roche, where I was uh, there with a group uh, to help a scientist prepare new drug applications for acceptance with both U.S. and European health authorities. And so it was more of like a consulting work rather than a kind of academic uh, assignment. Did that involve like writing patents or it helping really, just to get the, Well, the main documents were those that would eventually be part of an application for approval of a new drug that would be under development. That would be the main document. But in a company as large as Hoffman the Roast, there'd be a lot of internal documents and also a lot of internal communication. We were often asked to help with those, which would be people asking for more money or people who were in need of hiring uh, different um, new uh, scientists come in, and also a very vigorous and lively educational arm where there would be more in-house education. But the primary documents were those that would count or contribute to uh, an acceptable new drug application. Cool. Nice. So what brought you guys together on this research project? I think it started with me. I had uh, gathered some information based upon some uh, in-classroom research that I was doing in a theory class that I would normally teach in the spring. And uh, then I eventually uh, developed um, more raw data that I was able to input into an Excel spreadsheet uh, that grew from a pilot study into a, a first larger study that involved uh, over 200 students. And when I collected that data, I realized that I had an enormous gap in my ability to assess it uh, because it really required a very sophisticated statistical analysis. And so at that point, I went knocking on Scott's door and we started talking about it. I think it was probably some seven or eight years ago or I think so. it's more like 10. More like wow. 10 yeah. years wow. ago uh, to uh, make some sense of it, right. And since then, uh, Scott and I have uh, tried to think through the material that we had. We put it together in a presentation, and we've been in different parts of the country. We were in Virginia together. We were also in uh, Madrid, uh, Spain together, and this last summer we were in London as well, um, sharing some of the research that would be based upon ongoing studies after each um, uh, presentation. 
What was the question that the initial research project set out to answer? Well, the question was uh, formed from somewhat of a classroom discovery, and that is uh, I was teaching 13 students from different parts of the world, and I had each one of them come to the board and uh, create what I call mini-myths, which would be to name uh, a protagonist, to also identify an obstacle that protagonist would have to overcome, and then also describe the reward that they would get in a kind of spreadsheet. So we'd have uh, 13 rows and three columns of information. And once uh, each of the individual students, uh, half of them were young women, half of them were young men, and uh, they were from different parts of the world, once they had populated the table that had this information, we stood back as a class and looked at the protagonist column and each one of the protagonists named were male. And we thought after this extraordinary influence of the last five or six decades of feminism and cultural studies, there would be some kind of impact in which a female protagonist would clearly appear in at least one of these examples, especially among the most liberal students on campus who would take this course, we were somewhat shocked and a little bit dismayed that males were chosen in each category. Also, we noticed by looking at the third column, which was the reward column, that there would actually be a few female names mentioned there because uh, mm -hmm. cultures often do uh, recognize uh, the female as a reward for overcoming certain adversaries and obstacles. Kind of like how Super Mario Brothers rescues the princess. That's right. <laughs> Something as basic as yeah. that, you know, replicated yeah. in mythology and folklore. But we also discovered with equal surprise that there were no males in the right-hand column. So males are not seen as rewards mm. in mythology but they're seen as the protagonist or maybe the main actor. And I think that was the question that became clear is, you know, would this uh, disparity of sort of gender models, would it replicate in a larger study? And so from there, mm -hmm. we um, completed the first study of how many students were in the state, over 200, I believe. Yeah, every, every single time we did it, we did it over three times, uh, and but usually it was over 200 students each time. And uh, most of those countries represented, there'd be 40 countries, 45 countries. I think the last time we had it, it was less. But for the most part, it was, it was quite a few students, so it gave an, an, an international LDS flavor to the data. So we had, uh, you know, students from an international atmosphere audience, but the difference is, is they were also LDS, mm -hmm. which we, we weren't sure if this, uh, what we saw in the pilot study was a, um, you know, some sort of underlying idea of the LDS culture, or if it was just something overall, we weren't sure. But that first study, when we uh, checked it out, um, we saw that it was very consistent in what we expected in the first place, which was that females tended to choose females for their protagonists and males ch typically chose males. Mm -hmm. But the, the reward was never a person usually. Well, it was. Occasionally. Yeah, but most of the time it was some sort of non-tangible thing that you got. Like, mm -hmm. for example, they got a reward for being a better person, or they got a reward for overcoming this obstacle, they got satisfaction out of life, or they lived happily ever after, that kind of thing. Um, so, I mean, it, it just varied. So not even males were seen as rewards on the bigger scale? No. No, that's no. one thing that was consistent in all the studies is that you would, um, after the first couple of studies, we wouldn't expect there mm -hmm. to be a male mentioned uh, at all. And when we would kind of speak informally with our friends, <coughs> you know, about what we're doing, we'd often hear comments by some very bright people who said, well, that makes sense. You know, males aren't seen as rewards <laughs> at all. And we kept wondering, well... Well, why aren't why? <laughs> they, you know individual males might see themselves as a kind of reward but uh, yeah. as these mini myths were created we just noticed that they were consistently absent from that third column mm.
but were females seen? Not as much. Not as much? It still was mostly Mm -hmm. non-tangible stuff. But at the same time, you did see some males and some females, just a very low amount. Mm -hmm. It didn't seem to be as consistent to the traditional myth of, you know, uh, I, I kind of think of these as Greek myths where mm-hmm. a guy goes on a uh, trip and at the end he rescues a girl and they live halfway ever after her. Mm-hmm. It didn't tend to do that. They, they focused today more on the actual journey and the reward you got from it, which was, I thought, kind of still a progress towards equality, you know, for this idea of feminism that we're talking about. Because rather than seeing females as just the reward, they were seeing themselves as the actual protagonist. And they were mm-hmm. seeing basically the reward of the journey for themselves. So it was a positive outcome yeah. for you. And it, consist, it was consistent over the years. Over the three times we did it, it consistently followed that. What we also found it was there wasn't a lot of discrimination in the myth patterns from one culture to the next, right? Yeah, we tried to find out if there might have been some sort of difference if, say, you were uh, from the South Pacific, Mm -hmm. if your answers would be different. They tended to be similar. Same. Yeah. Hmm. And the main metric was gender. That was the main thing you were looking at. So across cultures, there was no discrepancy of um, the characters being... Yeah, everybody seemed to appear to function uh, the same, no matter which their culture was. Mm -hmm. I mean, we we thought there might be something there, we even thought there might be something from region of the earth where you're from, you know, like uh, South America. You know, that's not one country, it's just an entire region. And that didn't pan out as much. I mean, sometimes it would change, but that, that could be thought of as just the, you know, sample of data that you got as well. You know, that mm-hmm. it's just an abnormality for the ones we got. Like the last, the last one we had, we had uh, a lot of females this last one. It was interesting because I think just at that semester, it had over 150 females in the study, and wow. there's only 50 males in that one. Wow. But it still had the same conclusions, mm-hmm. that males chose males and females chose females. We often discovered when we would give presentations, for, ex- for example, the last one in London, that we would mention almost offhandedly that there wasn't much variation from mm-hmm. culture to culture. And a few of the people who attended that presentation uh, thought that was the most interesting part of the whole presentation, where we were more focused on yeah. gender issues. They were also really interested in this harmony of ra- of culture that um, apparently came through in the uh, in the presentation. So uh, we were still learning from the data, even though we had collected it and mm-hmm. organized it and massaged it in such uh, in, in certain ways. So have you ever? given this to people that do not go to our school like um sorry i don't know what they're called like a control group or like a. Um, we've had people that have been interested okay but we've we've never actually done it okay like um tested people outside mm-hmm. of the school to right. see what their ideas yeah. okay that was yeah. part of i mean that, that was at first first of all that was the attraction for it in the first place because mm-hmm. it was the international LDS classroom. Oh, okay. And then we were trying to figure out whether or not it would actually work outside of that. Mm-hmm. But we haven't actually worked with anybody to do that or collect data in that fashion. Mm-hmm. What do the results of this test say about stories in general? Because you have these mini myths, but do, what did you, I guess, what were your conclusions? Well, one conclusion was that there are certain patterns to stories and regardless of gender and regardless of culture uh, those patterns remain pretty much intact that there isn't a great deal of uh, variation Uh, the variation occurs just with the choice of names and the description of obstacles of course some of the unity of the myth had also been prefigured in the survey we asked them because they were actually guided to name a protagonist and guided to name an obstacle. So uh, a bit of the unity that we saw was uh, somewhat uh, established or even implemented in the in the uh, survey material that we asked. But um, uh, we see this very interesting discrepancy, and that is in myth. Uh, anything can happen. Mm -hmm. Any story can be told. And so the uh, surface elements of the story 
seem to be infinite, uh, but the underlying structures seem to be uh, fairly uh, set. And those underlying structures uh, actually provide for uh, an infinite number of, uh, of expressions. Okay, so this study um, you did, and you said one of the limitations, I guess, was that it was done at a LDS school. If you were to replicate this study at another university that was not LDS, would you expect, I mean, I guess this is all speculation, but do you expect different results, or would you expect similar results, or just wait and see? More of a wait and see, because you're mm -hmm. not exactly sure. It's it's like trying to um, decide the height of people at a different college when all you're looking at is the BYU Hawaii basketball team. Mm -hmm. You're not sure what you're gonna get. I mean, it's obvious with the example I gave that there's differences, but you never know until you actually sample it. Do you feel like you need to continue the study, or have you found all the results you feel like you need to find, or? Is there plans? I think we're probably, f at least my part, I mm -hmm. think I'm probably finished with it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think so. And I don't know if Scott wants to take it up sometime <laughs> in the future. Uh, I'm not sure about that. But um, one thing that uh, is in <clears throat> response to the previous question, when students would write down their answers, uh, they didn't have really much time to think about it. Mm -hmm. They didn't have much time to think about, oh, I'm... Uh, a 19-year-old uh, student from Thailand who's just converted to the church, and so here's... In other words, it was just put in front of them. Yeah. And... The we were trying them, to suggest it. We were mm -hmm. trying to get them to do it fast. Yeah. So just, they didn't have much time to formulate something. Right. So uh, it kind of got out of your subconscious what you felt. Yeah. Just what they would improvise at the moment. And, and this was uh, very important for us that we didn't really have time to think about it because that information was what we were looking for, what would sort of spontaneously come out of a request for this information. So they would fill in their names of the protagonist, then their obstacle, and then their reward, and then they'd have to turn the page over to give the name, their gender, where they're from, and personal information. And then that would all be put into a spreadsheet Mm -hmm. uh, and then Scott would do this remarkable analysis of it that mm -hmm. eventually produced the results we had. Mm -hmm. yeah. cool. Where have you presented this information? Three different conferences. Mm -hmm. Mormon, um, <coughs> was it Mormon Studies? Mo Mormon Scholars in the Humanities. That's what it was. And <coughs> then there is a very interesting organization called New Directions in the Humanities, which mm -hmm. is more of an international uh, organization and we met m once in Madrid at a university and then last summer we were at the Imperial College in London and that group was probably the most international. We had presenters from South Africa, people from Australia, a number from India, mm -hmm. Pakistan, yeah. uh, a very interesting group of people and also some of the keynote speakers were very interesting and they had of course topics that were related to subjects outside of our interests, which made the conference uh, very fascinating. It's a very interesting group to work with. I've always been pleased at uh, attending and presenting, but also at uh, listening to other present uh, presentations. And plus the Hyde Park Chapel was really nearby. It was beautiful. <laughs> yeah. That's right. Just right get to go on vacation, right? And <laughs> present. <laughs> what it's all about that's right <laughs> right we both had um, responsibilities at the conference but mm -hmm. then we also build in time to do things awesome. since we were there and I think that was uh, even yeah. an added pleasure to it was explore different parts of uh, England and elsewhere do you bring your families to these things or just you two go not, not typically but yeah. this, this time I took my wife with me oh, awesome. so she was there for part of it fun and my wife always goes. Always, yeah. She always goes because Absolutely. She, while I'm at the conference, she's at the museums and mm -hmm. at the um, cathedrals and uh, yeah. walking the uh, downtown areas of the old cities. So, wow. yes, yeah, she enjoys wow. it.
fun. Well, thank you for coming on our podcast and, you know, letting us just ask you questions about your research. <laughs> we really appreciate thank it. You. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks for tuning in. This was the Zeno Podcast. You can follow us on Facebook and Instagram at Zeno Podcast. That's X-E-N-O Podcast. If you have any questions or comments about what we talked about today uh, or suggestions for future episodes, you can email us at podcastzeno at gmail.com. This podcast was brought to you by BYU Hawaii's Reading and Writing Center. Thanks for learning by listening.